Oh my gosh. Whoa. That was unexpected. <laughs> Guys, I'm playing with you. <laughs> In environment and development, we deal with all of these horrible topics, and we forget about play. Play is a sustainability engine. It can drive us forward in the most difficult of situations. One, I'm on the floor because now everybody's awake, even the guy that was sleeping behind the curtain. <laughs> and you're listening to me, right? We have to talk about failure. Being on the floor is a great place to talk about failure because if you're awake in the environment and development arena, you're clear that we're making a royal mess of things in all sorts of ways. We don't know what to do with that information because everybody tells us that we have to have a plan about that. We don't have a plan. That's the other thing, is that on my way here, I fell upward. We can fail upward. And when you fail upward, you don't have to have a plan, but you have to have a vision for where you want to go. I was at a gaming conference earlier this week, and one of the developers who he codes for multi-million video gamers all together on the same platform playing together in real time, it's mayhem. And he said, when things really get totally out of control, you just have to declare a free to fail zone where you can just have everybody break all the rules, let them wreck stuff, let them ruin it all, and little by little they learn their way creatively into new ways of doing things and solutions. Right now, we're making a big mess of things, and it's totally possible we forget that if we play around with these situations, it's totally possible for us to learn our way into a new solution if we declare a free-to-fail zone. So this, for the rest of the day, all the other speakers are going to be so happy with me, that this is a free-to-fail zone. And it's like heaven. <laughs> Anybody else here would like a free-to-fail zone? Some nodding heads. Are you? OK, how about this whole room can be a free-to-fail zone? Actually, all of Norway can be a free-to-fail zone. In fact, today we're going to talk about how the whole planet is going to be a free-to-fail zone. And one way in which we can get encouragement about this is remembering that all of us began as species with a mistake, a genetic mutation, an error in replication, a great big oops that was placed in a very special position. And it allowed us to exploit resources. Now, this is why in, in development economics, we really love disruptive technology, because that disruption it all of a sudden unsettles things. It allows resources and energy to arise in a way that they never had before. It means that there's a convergence, and we can exploit that. We can create leverage in a way that we couldn't before. We can create new opportunities. We can invest small amounts of energy and result an enormous impact at scales we had not imagined. We're going to talk a little bit more about some of the things that we've tried. Um, but think about a few other examples. In China, high-efficiency air conditioners for the middle class, or educating girls in the developing world where small amounts of education can enormous, have enormous impacts for communities. They become also sustainability engines if we employ systems thinking to think about levers, and also if we see possibilities. We oftentimes miss all sorts of possibilities because we're blinded by our mindset. This is a graph depicting our mindset. It counteracts our mindset of where we think the big money in entertainment is. We think of it to be in music. We think of it to be in cinema. This is music right here, cinema. Almost flatlined over the past 20 years. Would you take a look at video gaming? Who'd have thunk? $150 billion a year? 
in 2011, there were um, about 153 billion hours per year of video games being played. By my estimates, that means that we're at about 300 billion hours per year, 6 billion hours per week. Can you imagine if we harness just a little bit of that potential against the world's greatest problems, what we could do? We also think about video gamers. Half of this, the blue line here, is due to cell phone. And so, of course, there's lots of emerging markets. And also, 50% of these video game players are female, something that's also not recognized. We also don't see the potential there. And again, we oftentimes think of video gaming being one of those things that's only played in wealthy countries, and that's also not true. Of the top 15 video gaming countries, the, the largest of the top 15, five of them are located in lesser developed countries. So India, Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, and Nigeria. Nigeria is that smaller bar there, but that's 31 million video gamers in one place. Malaysia, also very high, fourth highest density in the world. Republic of South Korea is, uh, is um, the fourth highest spender per capita on video games. $200 per year in a country like, like Korea. So there's all these misconceptions that we can also reform through research and also playing around with statistics, taking a look at things in a very different way. And so all of this I wrote up in a report called Playing for the Planet, published for UN Environment, Grid Iron Doll, and with the help of our friends at PlayMob. And when we released this for the UN Environment Assembly in Nairobi, we got several hundreds of thousands of downloads. And this really shocked us. For us, this was a major blockbuster. If you're a researcher, you know exactly what I'm talking about. We worked too hard for too few words that too few people read. But the video gamers were not impressed at all. They said, well, why aren't you reaching a million people? And in fact, if we're practicing what we're preaching, why aren't we reaching many billion? Because we have to align with the expectations that we're going to have by 2050, nearly 10 billion people on the planet. And we have to plan for that. So we set our sights a little bit more conservatively. We set our goal for reaching a billion people through video gaming. And we knew that there had been some successful campaigns. For example, Red became a UN ambassador. And we decided to reach out to all, as many of the AAA video game companies, as many as we could reach, those that have at least 5 million players. And we asked them to come to the UN General Assembly for the Climate Action Summit in September and pledge with us their commitment to the coming year and pledge the involvement of their video gamers in the future that we could co-create. And when one of the CEOs saw this report, he was flipping through, he said, oh, there's my company. And then he took a look, closer look and he said, no, wait a minute, that's a mistake. He said, our consoles have all sorts of energy efficiency mechanisms. That's not right, and he nudged his engineer and said, tell him. And it's true that the consoles did have energy efficiency mechanisms, but it's a siloed industry. Many of these corporations are very large, and what wasn't appearing is that at the warehouses, the default settings were getting reset for what the marketers determined to be in the greatest demand. So that is to say that instant on. You just pick up your console and you can play right away. Folks, these are our preferences that are deeply outdated. Even a few months ago, our preferences are radically changing as we're understanding the consequences of how we play hard on the planet and the kinds of futures we want to create. Oftentimes, this trade-off is seen as a sacrifice or the things that we're giving up, but this is not. This is about preferences. These are the things that we love, that we want to save. And so the CEO took, at that time, upon him to change the way in which his company was approaching energy efficiency. From the top down, then, his engineer reported to me that this, these changes had shifted the company's ability to insert new sustainability actions at a rate of 50 to 1. And all of these companies came together, 20 of them, 
for the UN General Assembly with the Climate Action Summit to pledge, and they formed an alliance called Playing for the Planet. All told, they sequester, they committed to, to the carbon offsets equivalent of 30 million tons, the equivalent to, say, Denmark's carbon footprint in 2017. They committed to planting millions of trees, inserting nudges in green games, and sharing with each other. Lessons like from Eco, which is a popular game, but it just help, happens to teach people different ways of imagining the future and playing around with environments. A game like Never Alone, where the heroine is an Inupiaq girl and her fox, confronting the realities of sea level rise and climate change, but also along the way intuitively teaching about indigenous and spiritual knowledge. A game like Minecraft Earth, it, Minecraft is very well known for being instructive, especially for sustainability and the building of different environments, but now it's an augmented reality game, so you can create structures in the world and share them with others. This game by Internet of Elephants, which is bringing wildlife into your homes or your offices or your streets. Or a game, this is a GoFundMe, where there's a robot that's being designed to interface with a video game so that you can go and actually, in real time, clean up plastic in the Chicago River. Now, our lab takes in a lot of information from drones that are currently being deployed in developing countries, amassing huge amounts of data, but without the manpower to interpret it. And you know, sometimes you have to do those CAPTCHA challenges to recode things using the human eye. We can do that with things like drone information, all of these people that go on video games to explore and go on simulated missions can become real ones so that we can create outcomes that we want to see in the world. And outcomes we must create. We must reform the way in which we view our economy. And that needs to be involvement of both private sector and public sector together. Now, earlier on, I'd mentioned this concept of, of uh, genetics and speciation, selection. All of us, each one of us in this room are actively participating in selection. We are choosing amongst the alternatives before us and we must improve the leakage to the, the circular economy system. Leakage like here in Norway, a country that is reputed to be very clean and green, and it is, but it is also the lar world's largest per capita producer of e-waste to the tune of 73 kilos per year per capita. That's almost 160 pounds. The Norwegian Environment Agency recently put out a report showing that a quarter of this e-waste goes completely missing. So that is to say it's disposed of improperly or it's exported in a way that's unreported. NRK did a wonderful documentary on this topic that was just out showing that the cars loaded, loaded to be sold in a second-hand market leaving Norway were filled with e-waste and ultimately radio-tracked them to destinations in Ghana, Namibia, and Gambia. This image I edited because it shows that there are real people here, and we care about the people on the other end of this. A uh, chicken egg from a chicken that's free-ranging in Ghana, in the world's largest e-waste community. One single chicken egg will put the human body 200 times over the safe limit of, of chloride dioxins and other carcinogens. These are things that affect the human body, and we can use images to compel emotional responses but video games are so much more involving and so much more technically adept to be able to create the same outcomes. We can select games in a better way. We can go to Steam and look for a tag called Nature. We can play with our children. There's no such thing as a problem without a gift for you in his hands. We seek these problems because we need their gifts. Each one of us is a selective agent. Each one of us can be that gift. Because do you know what happens when you play with every single person you know, and you play for more than you can afford to lose, and you play for the planet? You win. Shipmates, you win. Thank you.